Hey guys, we're going to do part two of the Gauss-Markov theorem discussion, jumping into our variance of the B1 hat OLS estimator. So let's get right to it, right? By reminding ourselves why this is important, right? So remember when we talk about the variance of our B1 hat, we're measuring how much dispersion variability there is in the position of that best fit line across repeated samples, right? So this is gonna be very important, and we wanna think about this as measuring, uh, for lack of a better term, the accuracy of our estimator, right? We'd always much rather have an estimator coming from a distribution that is tightly packed, if you will, about the true value, a smaller probability of being well away from the value that we're trying to estimate. So that's why it's important, right? Uh, and it's gonna have a lot of practical implications in terms of our ability to conduct hypothesis testing as well, which is gonna be the next step that we're gonna take after this. So when we think about the best case scenario, right? We're always gonna have randomness across repeated samples, but we would like to have that variability, that variance as small as possible. So all else equal you'd always want to choose an estimator with the smaller variance. And by all else equal, we're really talking again about bias, right? So if we had this little diagram, which we've seen before, comparing, say, distribution A to distribution B, they're both unbiased, but we would always prefer to have an estimator coming from distribution B, right? The probability of being at that true value, the height of that density function, is going to be larger, and the probability of being in one of the tails, i.e. far away from that true value, is going to be smaller. Right? And we would always prefer not to be dealing with distribution C over here because, well, the center of that distribution is in entirely the wrong place, right? So that's going to be our biased distribution. But between B and C, we're going to choose B because it has that smaller variance. That's the idea, right? A larger variance translating into a sampling distribution with a wider dispersion about that true value, about that mean. Almost always accept a higher variance if it means reducing bias, however. So we would take distribution A over distribution C, even though A has a wider a wider variance so in your your checklist be more concerned about bias nail that down first then see what we can do about minimizing the variance so uh, again we're talking about this in the context of that gauss markov theorem that relies on our classical assumptions right so what we say is if our assumptions hold what we would like to show is that our procedure the ordinary least squares estimator provides the unbiased estimator with the smallest possible variance. Right? So the other way that we said that was that OLS will be blue, the best linear unbiased estimator. And by best, that's what we're going to attack today. We're talking about the most accurate, most efficient, or smallest variance of all the unbiased linear estimators. So luckily, as far as that Gauss-Markov proof is concerned, we're halfway there, right? So the previous uh, little discussion that, of course, I will link to, uh, we walked through how, how to show that OLS gives us that unbiased result, again, in a simplest, the simplest possible mathematical framework, but the intuition was there. So now, basically what we want to do here is see what's on the other side of this equal sign. We want to be able to say that the variance of our B1 hat estimator coming from OLS is a function of certain factors, right? We want to see what those factors are, what makes that variance wide or narrow, and then we want to take that and turn it into something we can actually estimate and use given our sample data. So that's what we're talking about. The goal here that we're trying to accomplish is twofold. One, oops, cross that out. I was trying to underline it. One is a theoretical expression. That's more of what we would use to establish that we have the minimum variance. And again, to get the intuition of what makes it large, what makes it small, 
And then in order for us to move on and tackle hypothesis testing, we need a practical expression for that variance that we can estimate with observable factors. So we'll get all of that out of our discussion here. And again, we're going to do this in a largely intuitive, minimally mathematical way. Um, and one way to do that is to assume a simple regression model, y as a function of x. So not a multiple linear regression model. We're going to uh, kind of scale that up uh, a little bit later on, and the results are going to hold. It just makes the math a lot easier to follow. And of course, we're going to be doing this all in the context of that Gauss-Markov classical model. So we're going to assume all of those assumptions hold, and we're going to pay particular attention to the steps in the derivation where we need to refer to those specific assumptions. And we'll be calling those out and why that's important. Right? So essentially, remember when we did the unbiased, uh, the unbiased proof for the OLS estimator, we thought about it as just applying the expectation operator to the formula for the B1 hat term. Well, really we can think of this the same way. We're gonna be applying the variance operator. Think about it as a mathematical function that we can apply to a process, to a variable. And we're gonna apply that to our B1 hat formula that we also derived last time. So remember, this is what we used to show that OLS was unbiased, that on average, the B1 hat equals B1, and all of this disappeared, right, if our assumptions held that X and the error term were independent of one another. On average, that goes away. Well, we're going to start with this formula and just say, what happens when we apply, again, that variance operator to it? So it would behoove us to remind ourselves the properties of that variance operator. So let's imagine we have three factors here. C will imagine be a, being a constant value. C is equal to two, doesn't matter. It's a, it's a fixed value where Y and Z represent random variables with some distribution. Okay. So kind of definitionally, when we say that we are applying the variance operator, we're taking the expectation of the squared deviations from the mean. And when we see that y bar, we can think about that as our expectation, right? The expected value of y is the center of the distribution, or y bar. So we're, we're not doing this with the sample variance calculation, which would be actually calculating roughly the average squared deviation about the mean. Here, again, it's at that expectation level, so a little bit more theoretical in nature. So what happens if we apply this process, this variance process, to a fixed value? Well, it should make sense that the variance of a fixed number is zero, right? What's the variance of two? The variance of two is zero because it's always two. It doesn't vary. So as long as C is equal to C bar, which is the case for a constant value, the variance of that term will be zero. Now, what happens when we apply the variance operator to combinations of different variables? Say we have a constant times a random variable. Well, just go with the definition, right? So we're taking the expectation of the squared deviation from the mean. So what we can do here is just remind ourselves that C and C bar are the same, and we can factor that out but still square it, right? So the rule is when you see a constant value within the variance operator, we can take it out of the variance operator, but we square it because we have to apply that term. So the variance of C times Y is just C squared times, well, what's left inside the operator here is the variance of Y, expectation Y minus Y bar squared. So that's good, that's gonna be helpful. What about when we take the variance of a sum of random variables? So say the variance of z plus y. Well, again, just start off with the, the definition. So it's whatever we're applying it to minus the mean of that thing squared. Within that outer set of parentheses, we can rearrange this to make it a little more useful, right? And turn this into the expectation of z minus z bar plus 
y minus y bar all squared. And if you multiply that out, you get the expectation of z minus z bar squared, the variance of z, plus the expectation of y minus y bar squared, the variance of y, plus two times the expectation of z minus z bar times y minus y bar, which is the covariance of z and y. So the variance of the sum is equal to the sum of the variances plus two times the covariance. That's going to be helpful as well. Otherwise, I wouldn't have brought it up. I'm not trying to waste our time here. Okay, so let's take a look. And we'll do this again. This should look familiar. The same way we talked about the expectation operator operating differently on random variables versus fixed variables. Well, let's just kind of take inventory of all the things within that formula for our B1 hat and think about, well, what is going to act more like a fixed value C versus a random term y and z in the context of our properties of the variance operator expression. So the b1, again, that by definition is a fixed value. We don't know what it is, but it never varies across repeated samples by definition. Right? So fixed by definition. All of those x terms, whether within the numerator or the denominator, we are crossing our fingers that they can be treated as fixed values as well, but this isn't by definition, this is by assumption number three, right? So remember, if the covariance, and as always, I apologize for my penmanship with the mouse here, but if the covariance between x and the error term is zero, which is what our assumption number three says, well then, x doesn't have any random, whoa, that's supposed to be a zero, sorry. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, x doesn't have any random component, therefore it can be treated as exogenous or fixed across repeated samples. And that leaves us only with the ui error term as our only source of random, of the random variable in this term. So that's going to inform exactly how this is going to turn out. So let's jump into it. So step number one, we just cram that whole formula inside the variance operator. Good place to start. So now we've, we've got something anyway. Remember, before we just had the variance of b1 hat equal to question mark. Well, now we got something over there. It's the variance of all of this. And here, here's the spoiler of the story. We're going to try to narrow this down such that the variance operator only applies to the UI. and We want to see how we can get everything else out of there. But we got to do it step by step. So the first thing to notice, of course, is that that B1 is a C, is it's a fixed value, and it's totally uncorrelated with everything else. So we can basically just use the fact that the variance of B1 is zero. It doesn't co-vary with that sum x minus x bar u term and it can effectively be eliminated, right? So that's simplification number one. So we're left with the variance of this fraction now as the beginning of our next step. So step number two, we start with that, and we can again start to pick apart what's inside that variance operator by noticing that this entire denominator term, sum x minus x bar squared, as long as assumption three holds, all right, now we got to start citing those assumptions, it is going to be a fixed value. Right? And what can we do with a fixed value when multiplied by something else? We pull it out and square it. Right? So this term here is just that denominator removed and squared. So again, we're getting down to it. We're trying to remove as much as we can from the inside of that variance operator. And just to be clear, when we saw the, uh, the example, when we looked at the uh, kind of the features of that variance operator, we did the variance of you know, C times Y. This, we're doing the same thing, but now it's, we could write it as Y over C, right? So we're pulling, still pulling that C term out and squaring it, but it's in the denominator. Otherwise, exactly the same. All right. Oh, I already had it on the slide. Very good. 
Okay, so now starting with that term, now things get a little bit trickier to see exactly what's happening with what's left inside that variance operator. So here's the trick that I like to use to just kind of zoom in to that term. Let's think about what is happening under the simplest possible condition. So of course, this is a sum of n different products, right? So if n is equal to 1,000, we have 1,000 observations in our, in our data set, in our spreadsheet, right? This is going to be just a big string of these products. It's going to be, you know, observation 1, x1 minus the mean of x across the sample x bar times observation 1's error term, u1, plus, you see where this is going, observation 2, x2. 2 minus that same mean x bar times observation 2's error term. And there's going to be a thousand of those, whatever n is equal to. Well, that's awful hard to think about. So let's just say, what if we only had two observations? And then just to make it even easier, let's just not worry about the mean of x. Let's just set the mean of x equal to 0 so we don't have to see it. So this term here is the first term in the sum. So this normally would be x1 minus x bar times u1. This would be the second term, x2 minus x bar, but we're setting x bar equal to zero, and we're just truncating that sum at two. That'll be enough for us to see what's going on. Got it? All right. So starting from there, now we can again kind of look at what's inside that variance operator and see what's familiar. Well, it's the variance of a sum, and each of those sums is the product of a constant by assumption and something random by definition. So, we got a lot going on. Let's first take advantage of the assumption, again, that the x terms are constant, exogenous, or fixed, and act like that c term for each x1, x2, x3, dot, 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 through xn. So we can take the x out of each variance term and square it. So that's going to make things easier. Pulling out the c, turning it into c squared. And note that we're also taking the variance of a sum. So it's going to be the sum of the variances. Think about it, we're distributing the variance operator, plus 2 times the covariance. Here's what that's going to look like. I probably should have split this up into two steps, but we can follow this, right? So the x1 becomes x1 squared outside of the variance operator. x2 becomes x2 squared outside the variance operator. And then we have two times the covariance of the items that we're adding up. Now, this is where things right, become a lot more complicated when we have the full sum of n observations. That covariance is going to have to include every pairwise covariance, right? Every two error terms are going to have to be put in there, so it's going to be a string of covariances. It's a lot easier to see it in a matrix form, uh, which we may come back to at a later date. But for our purposes, intuitively, that's a good way to think about what's happening. Okay? So, we got, we've narrowed it down, right? The only thing inside the variance operator in two iterations here is the error term. All right, so that's where we're starting with. And here's another simplification. We might remind ourselves that assumption number four in our list of classical assumptions is that the error term observations are all entirely independent of one another. The no autocorrelation assumption is going to let us say that whole term, that covariance term, is going to go to zero because the only way that those are going to be covarying is through the error term. So assumption number four comes in handy. We can remove that. So what we're saying here, if each error term ui is independent of all other error terms and the x's are fixed, so we do actually need assumption number three as well. Make sure that the x's don't co-vary with the error terms across observations. So we've already had assumption number three cited. We still need it here again. So that whole thing disappears turns into a zero, and we're left with now this 
sum of the products of x squared and the variances of the error terms. And note, we haven't done anything with this term in the denominator. That's sum x minus x bar squared, all squared. We'll come to that in a minute. But now, we can again search our memory for that list of assumptions, and we've seen this before. We've seen the variance of the error term observations referenced before, and that was in assumption number five, which was our no heteroscedasticity assumption, or the assumption that every error observation has the exact same variance, or they are homoscedastic, if you prefer bunch of different ways of saying the same thing. And the mathematical expression that's going to kind of represent that assumption is that we can substitute in the same value for every variance. We don't know what that value is, but it's always the same. The variance of u1 is equal to the variance of u2, and we're going to just use that notation that it's equal to sigma squared. So that just references the variance of the error term for all observations. Observation one, observation two, and then when we expand it back out, all the way through the nth observation. We're just copying and pasting that same distribution all the way through. So let's go ahead and make that substitution. When we see variance of u1 and variance of u2, we put in a sigma squared. Boom and boom. Well now, we notice that we have a sum that each contain the same factor, that sigma squared, which can then be collected and factored out. So here we have 1 over sum x minus x bar squared all squared times sigma squared times this sum of the x squared terms. We've gone as far as we can go here with the simplification of two observations. So let's expand that back out and put in the the, the unknown non-zero mean for x, now this is looking pretty good. So the variance of b1, 1 over sum x minus x bar squared, all squared, times sigma squared, sum x minus x bar squared. Well, note this term, sum minus x bar squared, is the same as this term in the numerator, sum x minus x bar squared. Those can go ahead and cancel because that sigma squared is a fixed value. So that's going to cancel out the square term, And that's going to give us our formula. Ta-da! That's as far as we can take it. So go ahead and memorize that formula, right? But recall all the assumptions that we made to get us here. That's the real thing. The first thing is just to, to recognize that this is only the relevant formula, the exact relevant formula, in the case of a single explanatory variable. Again, there's an adjustment that we have to make when we have multiple x variables in our regression. But our focus here is, the big takeaway from this is all of those classical assumptions that had to hold, right? That that formula is going to be entirely incorrect if any one of those three assumptions, three, four, and five, are going to be incorrect. And that's a problem because when you're running a regression in Stata or R or Excel or whatever, and you ask for an estimated error variance, this is the formula that's going to be used to make that estimate. And it's only the right formula if everything works exactly right, if all of those assumptions are true. So to put that more emphatically, right, if the error terms are correlated with any of our x variables, assumption 3 is violated, that formula is going to be wrong, all of our conclusions are going to be wrong. If the error terms are correlated with one another, they are auto-correlated, and assumption 4 fails, guess what? The formula is going to be wrong, our conclusions are going to be wrong. If the error terms are heteroscedastic, if assumption 5 fails, and we can't plug in sigma squared for all of those values, they're actually different, well clearly the math is going to go off the rails, and guess what? We're wrong again. So a lot has to go right for that formula to be relevant. And really how econometricians kind of uh, make themselves worthwhile uh, is being able to recognize when those assumptions are going to be correct and when they are incorrect, how to test for it, how to diagnose it, and then how to fix the problem.
So we're just kind of setting the baseline and everything else is going to be comparing to this. So I know I'm running long here, but two more things that are going to be really useful here to take away from that derivation. And those are just, can we tell a story, right? We got that formula derived. The math was fun, but does it actually mean anything? Is there some intuition behind that formula? Does it actually make sense? Uh, and then we'll look real quickly at how we can turn this into something we can actually calculate and estimate with our sample data. So with that formula, the first part's pretty easy in terms of the intuition. It's the numerator term, the sigma squared. So the intuitive question simply is, does it make sense that as sigma squared goes up, the variance of the B1 hat rises? And yes, it does. Because remember that the sigma squared is the variance of the error term. So the more widely dispersed the error observations are, sample by sample by sample, the more widely dispersed our estimators are. The B1 hat, right, is going to be varying more widely as those errors become more widely dispersed. The picture that we might uh, remind ourselves of is that when we think of sigma squared, we're thinking of this, right? How much variation are we expecting to see for a given value of x in the associated value of y across repeated samples? So we remember, think about taking that error distribution, turning it on its side, and kind of thinking about those, those little green ovals there as representing, say, your typical variation in observations, sample by sample by sample. And that kind of gives us the, the extremes of what we might expect for typical OLS best fit lines, right? So the more compact that area of typical outcomes is, the more compact the variability in the prediction line is going to become, and the smaller the variance of B1 hat. So small sigma squared, error terms are compact, not much variability, that makes sense. Okay, so just, you can get pencil and paper, draw that out, right? Imagine widening out those dispersions, the, the line is going to widen out, uh, the variability in that uh, line is going to widen out as well. Things get a little bit less obvious when we think about the intuition of the denominator term. So this term, sum x minus x bar squared, what does that represent? Well, it looks a lot like a variance, right? We're not dividing through by n minus 1 to actually calculate the sample variance of x, but it's coming from the same area, right, in terms of measuring the dispersion about the mean of x. So when sum x minus x bar squared increases, we picture the observations of x being more widely dispersed from one another, more spread out. And note also that this is a sum of positive values across n observations. So the more observations you have, the bigger your sample, the larger that number is going to be as well. So as those x variables are more dispersed, we'll see less sensitivity to any one value of the error term and less volatility in the B1 hat coefficient estimate across repeated samples. So let's see a picture of this. If we imagine we've got only two observations, x1 and x2 here, and they're plotted very close to each other. And once again, the, the little green ovals represent the likely variability of the error term. Well, see what's going to happen, right? If we imagine kind of the extreme cases at the upper and lower end of that error variability, there is a really big swing in that position of the best fit line. So again, with that typical error dispersion across two tightly compacted X observations, we see that extreme sensitivity to any one error term. And we can imagine the variance of the B1 hat, the sampling distribution of the B1 hat spreading out accordingly. Okay? And then just to complete the picture, imagine we spread those X observations out but with the same error dispersion, the same distance between the highest and the lowest likely values of the error term, 
just the pure geometry of it, decreases the sensitivity of the position of that line to any one observation, and we're going to see a lot smaller variability in the position of that OLS line, and the B1 hat distribution becomes more compact. The variance will become smaller. So that's the idea of why it makes sense to have that sum x minus x bar squared in the denominator, forcing basically, again, the, the geometry of the position of that line to relate to the variance of the B1 hat. Now, we also mentioned the sample size, so the number of observations in, so those two little diagrams just had two observations close together or far apart. The other idea is the more observations you have, holding the actual average dispersion constant, same idea, the less sensitivity any one error term, the, the less sensitivity we're going to see to any one error term because there's more observations kind of to average across. But the practical implication here is that if you have the opportunity, you always want to include more observations in your sample, all else being equal, for the simple reason that it's going to make your estimation more accurate. Now, of course, this can get to the extreme, right, when we're thinking of big data, hundreds of millions of observations, we're actually getting towards the limit, right? Kind of the asymptotic limit of that variance, whereas n goes to infinity, that variance collapses to zero. And the way to think about that is we're no longer estimating over a sample, we're estimating over the entire population. So our B1 hat will be B1 in the limit. So that idea of the asymptotic properties of the OLS estimator, that's something that we'll dig into uh, the mathematics of more specifically later on. But here the idea is, if you have the choice of estimating a model with 50 observations or 100 observations, as long as they all have the same quality in terms of where they're coming from, the 100 observations is going to be better. It's going to reduce that sensitivity to any one error observation. So the last point, we need to now turn this into something that we can estimate, calculate, and utilize. So how do we estimate a value for this variance of B1 hat? again, with our simplified formula here. Well, the good news is, again, the denominator term, the sum x minus x bar squared, we know what that is. Not only can we calculate it, we've already calculated it because it's the denominator of the B1 hat formula. So that is no problem. The problem is going to be the numerator term, the sigma squared, which is the unknown variance of an unobserved distribution of unobserved error values. That's kind of a problem. So we're like three degrees away from being able to actually observe it. But what we do have in our arsenal, not the random errors themselves, but our estimated errors, our friends, the residuals, the U hat term. So we can't estimate the variance of the UI, but we can estimate the variance of the UI hat. So that's going to be our stand in or our proxy the sample variance of the residuals will be our estimated error variance. So we know how to calculate the variance of a string of observations, right? Typically it would be the sum, so say if the, the, the variable was z, right? It would be the sum of z minus z bar squared over n minus 1. We do something very close to that here. So the numerator is the same. So it's the sum of the deviation from the mean squared of the residuals. But instead of dividing by n minus 1, the 1 would be accounting for the fact that we have to estimate the mean of a sample. Here we divide by the degrees of freedom n minus k minus 1, where in our simple case here, k is 1, right? It always represents the number of slope coefficients estimated or the number of exogenous variables included in the model. But the reason we have to account for that is we had to estimate all of those coefficients in order to get the ui hat in the first place. Right? So these are lost observations or our degrees of freedom. So k is the number of x variables. And now we can simplify this because by definition of how OLS is constructed, the position of that line, we set the, uh, the intercept term to guarantee that the average residual is zero.
that's going to go to zero. And this now becomes simply our sum of squared residuals, the sum of ui hat squared over n minus k minus 1. That is going to be our very important calculation for sigma hat squared, the estimated error variance or the variance of the residuals. OK, so now all we have to do is replace sigma squared with sigma hat squared. And we now have an estimated variance of our b1 hat. So we have that big hat over the variance term. So variance of b1 hat hat estimated error variance divided by sum x minus x bar squared. So the next thing we're going to do is kind of come back to this formula and go through another one of those exercises where with a very small trivial data set just to walk through piece by piece how to make this calculation by hand and then turn that over into our uh, standard error calculation used in hypothesis testing. So that's all what's coming up next. But and it's going to become kind of a almost a rote exercise, right? To estimate a model, to look at the variance, to look at the standard error, to look at the t-stat and draw a conclusion. But don't lose sight of the lessons of this discussion, which is this formula that we're using here is sitting on top of a house of cards, right? The house of cards are those Gauss Markov assumptions. You pull out one, the whole thing collapses. So that was the real lesson of that derivation even though the, the practical implications here, again, are something we're going to be using all the time. OK, so that's, uh, that's good enough for now. Uh, hopefully this was helpful, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.